Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we, yes, we, you know what we do. We go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Hello, Allison. Good morning. We have to communicate with you. Look for an email from us uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> We're doing a road trip. We've got a road trip. Uh <laughs> Sitting here drinking chocolate milk and Bible study. <laughs> what's not to like about that? Yeah, what's not? To, Paula, Paula, thank you so much for the review that you put on Amazon. That is so helpful to us when readers of our books do that. It it really makes a difference in the sales of our books when somebody says something good about one of our titles. Now, I want to talk to you about Yebel. Y-E-B-L. Whenever you get under pressure, when you're thinking like, I used to tell God, I don't think I can take any more. He said, okay, we've established that. Now what? Uh, remember, yebel. When, you, when you're ready to, to blow your pop-off valve, you know what that is? You ever just go through something, you go, <laughs> I do that occasionally. And Kitty looks at me. I said, it's my pop-off valve, like a hot water heater. <laughs> remember, when you're under pressure, when you're in the heat, yebel. Did you know that there is a new creation chromosome on the inside of you? Chromosomes are made up of DNA. Human DNA is made up of four nucleotides. Now, what are you talking about, Russ? I'm just sharing with you. You ever wonder what rattles around in my brain? My wife knows. This is how God talks to me. Mm -hmm. And so I was pondering human chromosomes and the DNA the human chromosomes are made up of. And I looked it up and I looked at the four nucleotides and the Lord says there's a new creation chromosome made up of new creation DNA on the inside of you. And here, here is its breakdown. Y, yoke, E, easy, B, burden, and L, light. Yoke, easy, burden, light. You have yoke, easy, burden, light in your genes. Not your Levi's, in your genes, in your makeup, in your new creation DNA. You know there are scientists in the past who have claimed that they can tell a Christian by looking at their DNA, by looking at their, the makeup of their body, and they can see, they can see light in between the, the blood cells of a born-again person. I actually, I've heard that for a long time, and I went and looked up the research, and I thought it would have just been like a hoax, but in reality, there's some truth to that if you search it out. So, how do you pronounce Y-E-B-L? Well, I'm going to call it Yebel. It's like our friend Denise also, she, she travels in her job. She puts hundreds of miles on her car uh, sometimes every day, and she was going about her day, and the Lord uh, would give her little brief things, that, that little encouragements like, uh, hey, lose the attitude. <laughs> or be, or uh, be well, interruptible. Interruptible was the word. That and so I want to put that on the inside of you. When you're under pressure and you want to throw up your hands, just remember, Y-E-B-L. If it isn't about YBEBL, yoke, easy, burden, line. I'm going to get a T-shirt made with the chrom with the chromosome or DNA strand, YEBL, and people can and you can wear that T-shirt, and somebody's going to ask you, "What's that?" It's yoke. the chromosome of a born again believer. <laughs> yoke, easy, burden, line. Amen. What else could possibly go Amen. right? It doesn't get any easier than this. I remember when I was 12 years old and I hit the altar. Of course, I hit the altar every week and got saved. <laughs> and, but I remember one day, it was Wednesday night, actually, I got hit the altar and I got up. And you ever see a cat walk across a floor that he's unfamiliar with? And he, he, his paws are bouncing up because he doesn't like it. Uh, it. It's unfamiliar to him. Well, that's exactly how I felt. I felt like I was lighter than air. I went back to my seat and I'm telling you, it's like I was full of helium. It's like I, I needed a string to tie me down to my seat because I was floating like one of these birthday balloons. And my friend who went to the altar with me was feeling the same thing, like an angel just touched us from the, from the heavens. 
and we seriously had a manifestation of YEBL. So remember, remember that. That's the DNA of the new creation. You look it up, you could find the letters for human DNA, and I, I wrote them down a minute ago and I haven't memorized them, but the DNA of the new creation is Y-E-B-L, yoke easy, burden light. It is your nature to walk into every situation and your commentary looking back is it doesn't get any easier than this. Mm -hmm. What else could possibly go right? I know there's people that really screw up their face and get all concerned about a statement like that. But look, that's what Jesus is all about. Yoke easy, burden light, life, and life more abundantly. Praise so God. you've had your science lesson for today. <laughs> and a little picture of what runs around in my head whenever I'm not talking about something else. Thank God. I love that, uh, the inspiration that you get during prayer time in the morning uh, with the Father. We spend moments of time with Him, and He uh, talks back. So we need a coffee cup. We need to make a coffee cup with a picture of a chromosome like I posted in social media mm -hmm. with Y-E-B-L on it. Because if there's ever a time you need to be reminded, yoke easy, burden light, it's in the morning when you're having your coffee. Amen. <laughs> it's okay. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good Bible study today. Uh, a unique chapter in that it, it isn't a directive chapter focused on a partic on particular content or message, but it's just a disclosure of the glory of God, a reiteration very close to uh, what we saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. Astounded by glory. Astounded by the glory. In Ezekiel 10. Now get your dive buddy. Check your regulators. <laughs> Make sure your snorkel gear is all tanks are full of oxygen. Full and you're and you're ready to go. And let's go a little bit deeper today. We see this vision in this chapter of the glory of God, the four living creatures, and this peculiar arrangement of things, the components of this vision, that when you compare it, what we're going to study today, Ezekiel 10, with the vision of John, a very similar vision in Revelations 4. There is imparted to us an astounding revelation of what the glory of God is and what our position is in it and God's presence resident in our lives. It's 22 verses. Let's begin by reading verse 1 through 11, please. Okay. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hands with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in in my sight. Uh, now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. Wow. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels and from between the cherubim, that he went in and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the, unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of man, a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels as of the color of beryl stone. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness as of a wheel that had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went. I like what verse 5 describes. It describes the sound of the Lord God in the outer court. You know, I've been in some outer court churches, and you know, there's some folks, you know, that 
They figure if you're not going to a church that's filled with deep revelatory mist, fog, and understanding, that uh, that you, that's the only place you're going to find God. But, you know, there is a point that the coals from off the altar are scattered in the earth, and that's a time that Joel talked about. This is the Spirit of God being poured out upon all flesh, and the sound of God, verse 5, is going to be heard even in the outer court. <coughs> I can go to an outer court congregation and I can, there's inner court Christians and there's outer court Christians. And I can be in the midst of outer court Christians and still hear the sound of the Lord God. Now, in chapter 10, we see Ezekiel giving a description of his vision of the glory of God. Verse 1, I want you to pay real close attention. It says, in the firmament that was above, the head of the cherubims. So it describes a firmament above the heads of the four living creatures, or in this verse, cherubim. There is an important detail to note about this when comparing Ezekiel's vision in the Old Testament with John's vision recorded in the book of Revelation. So I need you to visualize something. First of all, consider Ezekiel's position, his physical position. He's looking from a distance at a lower vantage point up at the cherubim and the wheel within the wheel and the fire and all of this. And he sees beyond them and above the cherubim, he sees what he describes as a firmament. Now the word firmament means a visible arch or an extended solid surface. You say, well, was it a visible arch or was it an extended solid surface? Yes, it was both. <laughs> And we have to go back to Genesis. When we see God creating a firmament, the firmament of the sky above Adam and Eve, between man on the earth and the stars, as Adam would have defined them, or what we would recur, uh, refer to as outer space. And actually, it talks about the firmament above and the firmament below. Isn't that interesting? So... Just picture Ezekiel. The thing I want you to see is Ezekiel's on the earth looking up at these living creatures, and above them he sees a firmament, or an extended solid um, platform of some kind. So he's looking up from his vantage point in the earthly realm. He's looking through an intermediate space that is similar to where when, when Jacob looked into that intermediate space between earth and heaven, he saw a ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the earth. What Jacob saw at Bethel was very much akin to, you know, Jacob was kind of minimalist in how he described things, but it's very much akin to what Ezekiel describes in detail in Ezekiel 10. And so Ezekiel's standing on the earth. He's looking up at these angels and the wheels to the throne of God, and the throne of God is sitting upon this barrier, this visible barrier, referred to as a terrible crystal, a crystal sea, or what he calls here a firmament, a translucent or transparent firmament. We would call this, in modern common language, a transparent or translucent floor. Above the heads, it's like if you were uh, on some stairs looking up at me at the top of the stairs, you would see above me the ceiling. So picture, if you were looking at me, up a set of stairs, you're from a lower vantage point, and you not only see a ceiling, but you could see a transparent ceiling and see Kitty sitting on a chair on the floor of that transparent ceiling in the next level. That's exactly what Ezekiel was looking at as he was looking at the cherubim above them and seeing God, who was a fire from his loins up and from his loins down. Now, it's described... In Ezekiel 122, as a crystal, this crystal sea, this firmament. Now, these are obscure words to us because we don't commonly think of a crystal as being fashioned in this way, that a crystal could be used as more or less a pane or a monolithic surface that could be used for a floor or a window or whatever. But did you know that your cell phone, many of you, you may have a smartphone that has a screen that's either made of ion-strengthened glass called Gorilla Glass, or some manufacturers have used in the past, and some are considering using in the future, 
Sapphire, which is the gem world's second hardest substance after diamonds. If you have a smartphone that uses sapphire in the screen, you are literally looking through what the Bible would call a terrible crystal or a crystal sea. It's just a lot smaller. Now, bear in mind, remember what? Now, let me go a step further. Remember, and I want to plant this in your head. We're talking about a vision of the glory, a vision of God on his throne. Well, God's enthroned on your heart. Is that not correct? Amen. So when we read about this, we're reading about something on the inside of you. Now, usually when I preach this, I need to make a point that I'm speaking emphatic truth and not exclusive truth. Because if I don't say that, somebody's going to email me and say, you're not going to take away my cabin in the corner of glory land. I know one day I'm going to a planet called heaven. Well, you can just have that all you want, and I'm not trying to take that away from you. Listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. Whatever we may see of this, of the glory, the Bible plainly shows, and I'll give the verses later, that this is all about something of himself on the inside of you. And that being the case, remember, the scripture says we see through a glass darkly. Why? Because Hebrews tells us we need to have our conscience purged by the blood of Christ. What is your conscience? Some of you will get this. Your conscience is the crystal sea. It's the glass. We look in the word and we're seeing ourselves in a glass. Your conscience is that crystal sea. And if it is clouded by sin or clouded by works mentality or clouded by some other uh, dynamic, some other uh, capacity of something that is obscuring the throne of God that's on the inside of you, then you need to have your conscience purged. And so the, on the inside of you, there is a, I describe it sometimes as a membrane. I believe, man, if you could cut him in, in half, he'd be like cutting an avocado in half. There's the, the skin of the avocado, your, that would be correspond to your, your body. The pulp of the avocado would be your soul, your mind, will, and emotions. And the center of that avocado would be your spirit, which is composed of your conscience, your intuition, and your sense of, of uh, consciousness, your, the word would be sentience, your self-awareness. And uh, so that's why people like David, when he got crosswise with God, his conscience smote him. And we could just have a whole conversation. We could, we could write a book on this chapter, and we're not going to do it in this broadcast. So, again, I want you to bear in mind these references. Ezekiel's on the earth. The angels, if you can see my body language, I'm waving my hands. And <laughs> I talk with my hands, but you don't get that through the broadcast. Ezekiel's on the earth. The angels, cherubim, or four living creatures, are above him, suspended between heaven and earth, and beyond them, beyond the angels, looking up above them, the angels and their wheels, is a glass or a transparent crystal firmament or floor through which Ezekiel, because it's transparent, can see a throne. And sitting upon that terrible crystal upon the throne is the appearance of God as a fire from his loins upward and a fire from his loins downward. This is the position of man, the disposition of angels, and the ascended glory of God above all and ruling over all. Now, you've got that picture. Let's go to Revelation, where John has a similar vision with one very important dis uh, difference. Let's read just a few verses out of Revelation 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door, who's the door, is opened in heaven. Ezekiel didn't see a door, did he? No. And the first voice which I heard as it were a trumpet talking with me saying, what is the voice? The voice is the gospel. The door is open. The gospel is sounding. And what is the invitation? Come up hither. Ezekiel didn't get to come up hither. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that. And he said, I'll show you things which must be hereafter. Why is it he could see things that were hereafter? Because when you come up hither, you're stepping out of time into eternity where you can look at the end and the beginning all at the same time. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne, same throne that Ezekiel saw, 
sat in heaven and one that sat upon the throne. Now let's go to verse 6. We're not going to spend much. This is not going to be a, a detailed consideration of Revelation 4. Verse 6, and before the throne, in other words, what the throne is sitting upon, between John and the throne is a sea of glass. And it's not gorilla glass like they use in some cell phones. It's sapphire like they use in other cell phones. Like unto crystal in the, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were the four beasts full of eyes and behind. So all of a sudden, we, in Ezekiel, we see the four beasts below the terrible crystal, and God is on that crystal sea by himself. But below it are the four angels, and then the Ezekiel's down below that. But in Revelation, John is not sta standing underneath this terrible crystal because a door has been opened. Who's the door? And he's standing upon the crystal sea. And along with him, standing upon and not beneath the crystal sea, are the four living creatures crying, holy, holy, holy. I don't know about you, but that fires me up. Let's, let's keep going. What is the difference then? Let's review between what John experienced and what Ezekiel experienced. John, in his vision is not looking through, but standing on the crystal sea, looking at eye level at the throne of God. That's what the word righteousness means. Christ is our righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1.30. It's the ability to stand upright before the God whose throne is on the crystal sea, who's a fire from his loins up and from his loins down, and you're looking at him eye to eye as not just a servant, but a son. John was invited by an open door to come up higher. Ezekiel received no such invitation because the basis of Ezekiel's righteousness was adherence to the law. But adherence to the law does not uh, afford one access to the high places in God. Ezekiel receives no such invitation because the door, Jesus, was not yet available even as Job cried out, if I had a days man, if I had an intermediary, if I had somebody to stand between me and him, I would go and plead my case. But he didn't have that, did he? Neither did Ezekiel because the door was not yet available. John 10, 7, Jesus shows up coming out of that place where the Jews and no man on earth could dare to look because if you look upon God, you're not going to live. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes out of that place where we're afraid to look. And not only does he come out of that place, he came from God, went back to God, and as he returned to God, he became a door. He left the door open, folks. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Verily I say unto you, John 10, I am the door. John 10, 7, for I say unto you, I am the door. What door? The one that John stepped through, the one that Ezekiel didn't even have access to or knew existed. So this says something to us about the position we attain in Christ through the shed blood of Calvary. Ephesians 2, 6 says, He has raised us up together. Here's the door, come up higher, mm -hmm. and he has made us. He was not available to Ezekiel. Ezekiel had to content himself by looking upon, like Moses, who looked upon something that he could not have access to, because under the law, the law was imperfect and could not give man that which God had determined to make available to us in Christ. He's made us, to sit. You ever have your mama make you to sit? <laughs> He's made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Thus, we see the difference that Christ makes in his work on the cross. The intermediate round between earth and the throne becomes accessible not just to angels and cherubim, but to you and I. When we ascend to the heavens, you need to understand, when you ascend, 
You're in your native environment. The Bible plainly teaches you are a pilgrim, you are a sojourner like Abraham, that he went out, he knew not where, like Jesus, who's, who not only, look, he wasn't being sorry for himself, he said, there isn't a pillow on earth that I'm willing to put my head on. Why? Because his resting place, his native environment, was in the heavens. Mm -hmm. When we ascend to the heavens, we are in our native environment as new creations in Christ Jesus. Whatever the profound shock and the overwhelming experience that John has in Revelation 4, it is from the perspective of New Testament entitlement by the blood of Christ that Ezekiel is not eligible for Christ not yet having been sacrificed. So we're standing upon as entitled sons that which Ezekiel looked through but did not have access to because his only approach to God was that of a servant. Are you with me? <laughs> Take a hit on that regulator. Let's go a little deeper. Verse 12 through the end of the chapter. Um, did I, I finished 11, that's right. Um, and their whole body, and their backs, and their hands, and their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they for had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. And every one had four faces. <laughs> o wheel. What's the wheel? It's the wheel of nature that James talked about. My words are spirit and life. The spirit of God was in the wheel and the wheel is set uh, in motion by what? James said by the tongue. It'll either be set on fire by the spirit of hell or set on fire by the spirit of God determined by the content that you choose. So we need to start talking to our wheel. <laughs> Who's with me? Amen. Verse 14, And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub and the second face was the face of a man and the third face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Now, we don't like it when somebody says we're two-faced. So next time somebody tells you you're two-faced, says, no, you got it wrong, I'm four-faced. Four -faced. I have four faces. <laughs> <laughs> and the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chebar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, they stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were besides that, beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house in the glory of God of, of the God of Israel was over them above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Chebar, and I knew that they were the cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, and every one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings. And the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river Chebar. Their appearance and, and themselves, they went Everyone straight forward. Now I want you to see something else. And you're going to have to go back and read this chapter to make note of these details. Having seen now, let me dial it down. Let me just be real intellectual here. Let's be GQ for a few moments. Having, I have a hard time being unmoved emotionally by these things. It's not just my Pentecostal background. Because let me tell you something, when you talk about this stuff, it's like chewing a piece of meat. It just gets bigger. And when you talk to the glory of God, it gets bigger on the inside yes, of you. Yes, it does. And it's like, hello, I'm going to be a fire from my loins up, from my loins <laughs> down. Because the longer I look at him, the more I'm like him. Amen. It's the same thing about you. Mm -hmm. Having seen now Ezekiel's position in the old covenant disposition, in the old covenant dispensation, and comparing it with John's position in the New Covenant. Ezekiel is down below without access. John is standing upon with an open door making it possible. And it's a vision 
of the glory of God. In the vision of Ezekiel 10, the four living creatures and the cherubim, they're seen suspended above the earth with the terrible crystal or transparent flooring of the throne above them. Well, wait a minute, these are angels. How come they were not standing on the crystal sea before the throne? I want you to think of this. It wasn't just Ezekiel below the crystal sea. The angels were too. Same thing that happened to Jacob. He didn't see the angels in the heavens. He, seen that he saw them in the intermediate realm between the earth and the heaven. And just, just think with me. In the New Testament description that John gives, however, these creatures or beasts, these four creatures, like John himself, are not below but above and before the throne ministering directly to God. In the Old Covenant, and in Ezekiel 10, and every other place it's manifest, they're always below, like the men that see the vision. Ezekiel was below, and above him was the angels, and above that was the crystal sea with God standing alone or sitting alone on the throne. But in the New Testament, not just John is standing upon, but now, for the first time, we see the angels, the four living creatures, standing upon. This is very important, something I never saw in this as I studied it. Now let's talk a little more about that. Again, let's read Revelations 4, 6 through 8. And upon the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Now if we could be standing on that crystal and look back in time, you'd see Ezekiel looking up there saying, hey, waving at you. <laughs> he, but he couldn't come up because he didn't have the door like we do. And uh, there's a sea of glass like unto crystal. And it doesn't have an Apple logo on it. Hello. It's not an iPhone or a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the ultimate smartphone. And <laughs> round about the throne were four living creatures, four beasts full of eyes before and behind. You know, in other words, man, now we see these eyes. Why? Maybe those eyes were closed to Ezekiel. How come Ezekiel didn't see them? Maybe they had their eye closed. Maybe because they didn't want to look on sin. Maybe because they knew they were in a fallen environment. Mm -hmm. But when they got up in the, into the glory, it's like me and you. I'm all eyes. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the first beast like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like the face of a man, the fourth like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them have six wings. And six is the number of man. So it's saying something to us of man, or at least it's saying something of who God is in us. And they're full of eyes and they rest not. In other words, they, we were praying that today about, about the eye of God. To, he's, David said, he guides me with his eye. And we were praying, God, when we go on this road trip in September, when we walk into a room, let your eye walk into the room with us. We, we stepped into something this morning. And it wasn't out there in the backyard because we didn't clean up after the dog. And it says, they rest not day and night, because they don't need rest. They're like Jesus at the well. He was tired, exhausted, and hungry, but because he was doing the Father's will, when they showed up with the food, how many times, Kitty, have I walked away from a plate of food at a restaurant because I was partaking of something when I was speaking Amen. or prophesying to the person across the table? Amen. See, because when that, when whatever that is described in these four creatures in Revelation lights up on the inside of you, there's something in you that says rest not because there's no rest needed because you're eating the angel's food. And what is the angel's food? It's what was given to Elijah and he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days. You're partaking of something that you can't get at the GNC store. That's right. <laughs> God. So, so the suggestion here is not only is Ezekiel below and John above, because Ezekiel doesn't have the door of access that John had. We also see that because Ezekiel's disposition was limited to below, the angels were below as well. But then when you see John above, the angels are above as well. That's important to notice. That the disposition of angels before the throne was fundamentally changed. Don't you think they understood that much? 
when they showed up to the shepherds and they said, fear of not, we got some good news. There's a door about to be open to you and where you're going, we get to follow. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that angels were redeemed. Because 1 Peter 1.12 says angels do not and cannot have full comprehension of redemption. Because redemption is reserved for man, being made in the image of God. Angels were not made in the image of God. And therefore angels have no path of redemption they could be restored to. Why can't an angel be saved? See, because an angel was not made in the image of God. There's nothing to redeem. Therefore, when we think about fallen angels, angels can sin, but 2 Peter 2, 4 tells us they cannot be redeemed. Man, however, can be redeemed. Psalm 8, 5 says man was made a little lower than the angels, and that's exactly where we see Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 10 here, he's below the cherubim, up above him, and beyond them passed a barrier that was not only between him and the throne, but between the angels and the throne. He sees this barrier, but see, the angels were created as intermediate functionaries between man and God, between heaven and earth. And what was the distance between God and man in the Old Covenant? It was a gulf of sin. What's the distance between redeemed man and God in the new covenant? It's the distance between the right hand and the throne. It's a lot less distance. However, the, again, the angels were created. See, Ezekiel's lower than the angels in Ezekiel 10. And because the angels were created as intermediate functionaries between man and God, between heaven and earth, when man was brought and seated in heavenly places in Christ, that changed things for the angels as well. It's like your angel, what am I saying? Your angel is sitting there next to you with his arms folded and his toe tapping, and he's saying, do you get it? Do you get it? I wish you'd get it because I'd sure <laughs> like to change my geography. If you could talk to an angel about things that were important to him and what he wanted you to know, he'd say everything you need to know, you could learn by going to real estate class. Location, location, location. I wish you'd get it so that we could change location and not just be looking up into these things we're peering at in the things of God, but to step through that door and stand upon that which Ezekiel was only allowed to look through. See, angels were created to minister to the glory. And the angels were there defending the path to the glory of God. Just as the angels were in front of the Garden of Eden at the gate, defending the path to the glory of God, lest man in his fallen condition tried to enter therein. But when Jesus became the door and paid the price, there was nothing for the angels to defend because that glory they were defending is not only in the heavens, but it's in the heart of every redeemed man. Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord. Angels are created to minister to the glory. And we know according to Colossians 1.27 that the glory is in us. Therefore we know that the angels attend us wherever we are because the glory is irresistible to them. <laughs> the glory, angels are always pressing into the glory. I was in a church. I've told this story a couple of times. God, you ever have God make you go to church? God was making us, making me take Kitty to this church that I didn't want to go to because when I went there, I saw things that I didn't want to see. Because they didn't accept the prophetic, and they certainly didn't accept us. And I could see what was going on between the pastor and his wife. I could see what the worship leader and his wondering eye was doing while he's supposedly praising God. And I could see the deacons and other people that were grumbling, fomenting rebellion against the pastor. And I said, okay, God, I'll go to that church if you'll let me turn this x-ray vision off that you gave me. He said, okay. 
So he gave me a switch. And when I walked into that church, I flipped the switch. And instead of seeing all this garbage going on in the congregation, I saw the glory of God. And it had, and, and above the, the, the congregation, I saw this vortex of God's glory and this light and, and clouds just whirling around. And the angels were going around and around and around the glory on the outer wall, kind of like that the glory was like a centrifuge. And they were trying to press into it. And so they'd go round and round and round. And when they'd get up to a certain speed, they would turn toward the center and make a break for the glory. And they would they would uh, penetrate the glory, but it's like the glory would grab them and throw them out. <laughs> and they would be thrown against the wall and splat and slide down to the wall and get up and shake their heads and do it again. <laughs> I was just, I was astounded. And God says, that's what I put on the inside of you. The angels pushing into the glory that is now on the inside of you. What the angels were defending in the Garden of Eden is now on the inside of you. Of the tree of life. See. Finally, in considering this vision of Ezekiel, and comparing it with the vision of John in Revelation, bear in mind that Ezekiel's vision, according to Ezekiel 128, is a vision of the glory. And John's vision, likewise, is of the glory of God. Now, John's vision and Ezekiel's vision are alike in many respects. What that tells us is that if you and I could look at the glory today as they looked at the glory, it would look similar. If you could look on the glory, this is what you would see, wherever the glory is found. Now I have a question. Where is the glory found? Is it on a planet called heaven? Hardly. There is no biblical reference that would justify the contention that heaven is a planet somewhere. Is it on, and I can have a long conversation with you about that, uh, is it on some mystical distant Olympus, as Greek mythology suggests? Now, that is a compelling thought, but it is more rooted in Greek philosophy and influence and thought than it is found in the Bible. Where is the glory? What Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, what John saw in Revelations 4, Colossians 1.27 says, is on the inside of you. Now, I ain't messing with your little cabin in the corner of glory land, so don't get mad at me. When we look upon Ezekiel's vision and upon John's vision, we are seeing something. And if you don't want to accept it, at least believe that it's something representative of who God is on the inside of us. Not enthroned in some science fiction concept of buckaroo bonsai in the eighth dimension, but he's enthroned in our hearts. And to this our eyes are opened when we see in Revelations 4, God on the throne, and he is enthroned in your heart, is he not? And we see four living creatures crying, holy, 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 and we know that your heart has four chambers, a physical representation of a spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. And we see also the 24 elders surrounding the throne, just as you can find 24 ribs encasing and protecting the human heart. Mm -hmm. When God first showed me this, I had to go find out if a woman had 20, if a man had 23 ribs and a woman had 24. Uh, and you'll hear people I've heard preachers say that as proof of creation that man has one less rib. That is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, Carla, if you're listening, you can ask Paul, your doctor husband, <laughs> and he took, a, he took Gray's anatomy and he can tell you that there's 24 ribs in a woman just like there's 24 ribs in a man. 24 ribs around your heart, God's enthroned in your heart, 24 elders, four chambers, four living creatures. Remember he said, I stand at the door and knock, bump, 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 your heart, mm -hmm. and God sitting upon the throne, mm -hmm. and those four living creatures, every beat of your heart, crying, holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty, which is and was and will be forevermore. Mm -hmm. 
See, it's God saying something. He's trying to tell you about who He is on the inside of you. This is the mystical glory and the apparatus of a wheel within a wheel and the angels with the wheels beneath them of processes of spiritual dynamics that are churning on the inside of you as the rule of God flowing out from you as children of the king, as a king under the king of kings and as a priest under his altar. All representative of these, this wheel, these creatures, and the glory, and the crystal sea, all as something. It's like an anatomy of the new creation saying something of who he is, his glory on the inside, manifesting himself within you and in the community of the redeemed. <coughs> so, Father, we thank you for this anatomy class that we've had today. Thank you that you've disclosed through Ezekiel and through John something of our position in you. Thank you that there is a door. Thank you that we're not like Ezekiel. He didn't have an invitation to come up higher. I thank you that if there's anything we know about Jesus, he's, an open, he's the personification of the open invitation of God to come up higher. And so we're coming up higher today, God. And we can see those four living creatures on the inside of us. Those four chambers of our heart crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. Those 24 ribs, those 24 elders on the inside of us that are falling down and casting their crowns at your feet. We truly are the temple of God. That we have a crystal sea. We have a conscience that is completely transparent. Our conscience is not opaque by dead religion. Our conscience is transparent. Our conscience is the terrible crystal because it's been sprinkled with the blood of Christ and we see with clarity that which Ezekiel only glimpsed in obscurity. We thank you, Father, and we ask for a manifestation because we know that you said in Philippians 4.19 that out of the glory, out of the glory, out of this glory that Ezekiel saw, out of this glory that John saw, all of our needs are met. In that representation of what you put on the inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen.